most people are aware of the notion of precession. It is often referenced in many New Age paradigms about the coming of cyclic disasters. The mainstream has a very fixed idea of what precession is. But what if this was completely wrong? What if the cause of precession was far simpler and hidden within this simplicity lies a fundamental truth about our local neighbourhood? Observations have shown that the Sun rises in different constellations throughout history. It is believed that this cycle takes about 26,000 years to complete. It was first discussed by Hipparchus in about 150 BC. He used older data of the star Spica and determined that it had moved about 2 degrees relative to the autumnal equinox. He concluded that the equinoxes were moving. Unfortunately, most of his writings have been lost. There is mention of this by Ptolemy, who explained precession as the rotation of the celestial sphere. There are also claims that the Mayan long year count involved the Pleiades and may have been an effort to calculate the precession of the equinoxes. And there is also some evidence that the Egyptians were aware of this movement as well. There is clear evidence that the Indian astrologers were aware of this procession for a long time, and in the most recent translations of the text, they derive a period of 25,461 years. It was Copernicus who first suggested that this movement of the equinoxes might be due to the Earth-spin axis wobbling. It was Newton who then assigned gravity as the cause of this. To date, there is no evidence that any of the axes in any of the planets within the solar system are actually wobbling. His initial equations never match the actual precision rates, and so a long series of tweaks was initiated by many different people to attempt to bring the value back in line with observations, but none have ever questioned the underlying assumption. The first laws and principles of physics that any human learns, they do so before they are old enough to read, or even talk. And unfortunately our intuition tricks us into believing it is simply a downward force. By the time we go to school and learn that gravity acts between two masses, it is too late and the damage is done. And even Isaac Newton fell victim to this delusion. Now most of you have seen or used a gyroscope. Spin it up and you can easily balance it on your finger. Move your hand slightly to the side and the gyroscope will start to process, like a wobble. And this means that the gyroscope's top axis wobbles in a, a circular motion while the bottom axis remains fixed. The problem with this setup is that when we examine the forces involved, it requires two important things. Firstly, it must be fixed at the bottom axis. And secondly, it requires the force of gravity to be acting downward. And if we remove these two conditions, something totally different happens. So if we examine what happens to a gyroscope in space, it will become more obvious what should actually be happening to the Earth. Um, I'll just get this gyroscope here. And it's just a, a toy gyroscope, really. But of course, in zero gravity, if you knock it, it's going to tumble, it's going to move around um, like any object up here does. However, if I get this uh, spinning, just give me a second. So once the gyroscope is sp spinning, you can just see how stable it becomes. And however I knock it, it's not going to change its plane. It's going to remain in the same plane. I can put it physically into a different plane and tap it again, but it will still hold that same plane. And it's uh, much more stable. So it just gives you an idea of uh, how we use spin stabilization and gyro stabilization for control on board the International Space Station. 
And as we can see in the video, no matter what the sideways movement is, the spinning gyroscope stays in the same orientation no matter what the force is. Newton believed that the precessional wobble was caused by the fact that the Earth bulges at the equator, so it's not a perfect sphere. And at the same time, the Moon orbits around the Earth and orbits around the Sun, and that the combination of the forces of the Moon pulling on part of that bulge and the Sun would cause a, a wobble force to be uh, initiated on the Earth, causing it therefore to wobble. But as we can see in the video, no precession is set up at all. The gyroscope remains perfectly aligned in the same orientation, no matter what forces are applied to it. Now as time went by, observations started to appear which would indicate that something other than precession was happening. So let's examine some of the biggest issues with precession. So number one, if we examine the equations that are used to calculate this, we will see that they are based on a mathematical formula and not on the mechanics of how the solar system works. And this formula only works when the starting point is pinned at a very specific date. And it is only accurate for a short period of time. So if we were to scale this up into the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, the time that it would give you for precession would become more and more inaccurate. So this means that as we move through time, they are having to tweak this formula all the time to account for the discrepancies in the uh, observations compared to the equation that they are using. Number two, Crattendon realized that if the Earth was precessing due to the gravitational tug of the Moon and the Sun, that it should cause a slow shift in the timing of our seasons. But looking at historical records, we can see that the seasons have not changed over our recorded history. So in order to fix this problem, they had to actually fix the equinoxial point. It rotates around the sun and it takes 365 days to do that. It takes a full year to complete one orbit. From when we start, so let's say that it is the, the uh, summer solstice, then you would know that the sun rises in a particular point. That point means that the Earth has to be facing that same point. And then as it moves around the orbit, when a whole year is complete, it would once again face the same direction. So the equinoxial point is fixed at that point. It is always uh, uh, 360 degrees. So as the Earth moves around the sun, it would effectively rotate 360 degrees. Now realize that the, the Earth itself obviously rotates every day on its axis, but every day it has to rotate a little bit further in order to keep facing the sun. Imagine as you're going around the curve, as the Earth turns, it has to every day turn a little bit further. So therefore, by the time we get round to a full circle, it will effectively have, have done an extra 360 degrees, so that it ends up facing at exactly the same position. So in order to fix this, what they did is they said, well, that point, we're actually going to process it. And they knew that the processional cycle was 25,700 and whatever it is, 51 days. So in order to imagine what that means, imagine taking the circle that the Earth follows and dividing that up into 25,751 little chunks. So they said that every year that the Earth, that the processional point, the point at which it then returns to face the Sun, would be at position one for the first year and then at position two for the second year and so on so you would trace out a full circle so it would take 25,751 years for it to return to that original position so they processed the the movement of the the, the earth so effectively what would happen is the earth every year would not rotate a full 360 degrees in its orbit. It would only rotate 359 degrees and whatever else 
the, the you know 10 seconds whatever it is so it meant that every year it, it the point at which it was facing back would be a little bit further on and then the next year a little bit further on again until it completed the full cycle and back it was and using this it fitted back in so if they use this model then the um, seasons would no longer move the problem was that when we then observed the lunar cycle then if we use this to calculate Earth's orbit it shows that it does actually follow a 360 degree path and in fact if it followed the other path so if they indeed fixed that point then we would see changes to the lunar cycle which we don't see it's pretty regular like a clock so we are back to the same problem that this does not show that the earth itself wobbles due to precession number three Homan was interested in why the Egyptians used Sirius to mark their calendar and he discovered that Sirius rises with the Sun the same day every year he did transit timings of Sirius and found that it moved at a rate that kept it with precession or well should we say from processing along with the other stars so here we have a star that is refusing to follow precession so if the earth is wobbling why is it that Sirius keeps rising at the same point because as we have seen we would expect the star to rise in different points as the earth wobble causes the movement of the earth to change effectively where we are looking so why is it that we still believe in precession well both Cruttenden and Homan believed that there was evidence that Sirius was in fact circling us they believed that it was a binary star of the Sun and that this would explain why it was that Sirius maintained the same position relative to Earth compared to the other stars moving and they speculated that this gravitational tug was responsible for the precession that we see so that it wasn't due to the moon and the sun but it was due to Sirius now Jim Weninger analyzed the motion of Sirius in more detail and determined that the motion of Sirius meant that it was not orbiting about a common center between the sun and Sirius and instead that the center of axis for the Sun and Sirius appeared to be much much further apart and in fact that this center could explain the whole reason behind precession so I asked him how he came across this idea before I came to EU I was pretty much mainstream person the source I first got that we came we were orbiting the Pleiades and our tourists, our tourists directly, and then like maybe collectively around the Pleiades. It was in, a, you know, obviously kind of new agey source, and I basically debunk it because it's it's unworkable from um, a gravity only point of view. For example, we can't be bound to the Pleiades. There's like something like 800 solar masses, but it's whether it's 387 or 425 light years away. There's no way that gravity is going to keep us bound. And in part two, we will dive into Jim Weninger's model in more detail to understand how a very simple assumption could explain this motion in the most elegant way. We will examine our local neighborhood and draw in the ideas of an electric and plasma universe to help explain this model. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.